there. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, all right, and um, any further discussion on that uh, motion to amend the agenda? All right. So let's uh, let's uh, handle let's, let's vote on. I guess we'll vote on the agenda, modified agenda, and the roll call at the same time. Uh, Jenna, will you call the roll and the uh, approval of the agenda simultaneously, please? Anderson. Here and I. Bailey. Here and I. Barber. Here and I. Barnes. Here and I. Boyles. Present and yes. Crimmins. Here and I. Degan. Here and I. Foster. Here and I. Martinson. Here, I. Geisler. Here and I. Giuliani Stevens. Here, I. Gattel. Here and I. Heyman Rowan. Here and I. Hansen. Here, I. Holberg. Here, yes. Hollinson. Here and I. Harwaski. I. Linda Key. Here and I. Look. Here and I. Malichnik. Here and I. McDonald or Bewin. Here and I. McGuire. Here and I. Narayanan. Here and I. Petrick. Reich. Here and I. Sanger. Yes. Schumber. Here and I. Stephenson. Swanson. Tolbert. Ulrich. Here and I. Wind shuttle. Here and I. Washi. Here and I. All right. Thank you. The. Um... Roll call is complete and the agenda is approved. Uh, good work. Now, the reports, I've got a couple of things on the uh, tab chair report. Uh, first of all, uh, Elaine has had some folks uh, express interest in the executive committee. Uh, I've got our agenda and everything up on a separate screen here. So uh, Elaine, you've got about a half a dozen folks that have expressed some interest. Uh, we want to make sure, I think, we get those names and uh, folks that are interested in serving in the exec committee by the end of December. So, Elaine, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, right now, we are still light on volunteers for city and for modal rep. Modal, with, modal reps and city reps? Yeah, because with Mary, Mary Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Mary now becoming a county commissioner, her seat is open, and I've only heard from one city person, Mark Winshuttle, who's currently on there. We would need another city representative to step up, or a couple, and then also the modal one. We didn't get any volunteers yet. Uh, this is Matt. You can put me down for modal. Okay. All right. We were wondering, uh, Matt, if you were interested. We hadn't heard from you yet, so thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, it on that. Now, I think, uh, Elaine, in the uh, packet, <clears throat> was that letter from uh, Metro Transit in the packet for everybody? Yes. With regard to the turn back? Mm -hmm. So that's that's an issue we, we're going to have to address today as part of this regional solicitation conversation. So we get no, a letter sir. from... No, Mr. Chair, as, as long as you brought it up, uh, to simplify the agenda, if I could make a recommendation. Well, just as part of my chair's report, Commissioner, let me finish out the, okay. part of the background of it, and then you might have a recommendation. Um, okay. So here okay. is what Thank happened. You. There was an award to Metro Transit uh, back in, we think, approximately 2010 for project years 2013 and 14. It was about uh, seven point, almost $7.3 million. And uh, they've turned back 4.4 to 4.5 million. It'll be the range of the turn back uh, amount. They're not going to go forward with the project. They were allowed to spend uh, about 3 million on projects that were related. Uh, apparently, it was totally appropriate. So there's no question there about whether they have to turn back uh, what they were initially granted. So we've got 4.4 to 4.5 coming back. 
And the, the question for us today to think about when we get to that portion of the agenda is, uh, with the respect to that money that's being returned, uh, should we put that into a project in this current solicitation for 2024-25? Uh, or do we want to hold it for the next solicitation beyond that and just kind of park it now? Uh, and, and where we want to allocate it or how we want to allocate it is something that we'll talk about. Uh, and then when we get to that portion of the agenda, then I'll have Commissioner Karwaski uh, give us his thoughts at the front end of that conversation. Uh, and then uh, with respect to the um, other issue that uh, popped up in the last couple of days, uh, Federal Highway and uh, Federal Transit Authority uh, have this periodic responsibility of um, reviewing the, work of, uh, the, uh, the Met Council as the MPO. So they're going to be reviewing the council's planning processes on December 8th and 9th. And as part of that process, they offer uh, a presentation to policymakers. And um, if the tab members are interested, we could make it easier uh, to hear that presentation if you're so inclined to do it at the end of a tab meeting or before a tab meeting. I think uh, as to those two potentialities, I think after a tab meeting might be better to schedule it uh, for a session right after a tab meeting. Uh, so uh, we need to know whether our A members are interested in that kind of a session. Uh, Elaine, how long would that session last, do you think? Uh, it depends on the number of questions. Um, FHWA would pr um, provide an overview of the process that they did the prior week. Or eighth and ninth is when they're doing the certification review with the yeah. council staff. So they would go through that and then get any feedback from the tab members on the process. So I don't know, half hour at least, and then it depends on the questions. So if we do that, uh, if we do that in the middle of December, uh, as part of our tab meeting in December, where we've already got some uh, heavy work to do with respect to the regional solicitation. Uh, is that an appropriate time to do that? I know they've also got a survey on their on their planning processes on the FHA, FHWA, FTA website, and you could probably comment on that as well, where people can make their comments in advance. Um, I don't think we're gonna have tab members, let's see, I'm thinking that if we do this in the middle of December, they will already have done their review. Uh, so if tab members want to make a comment about <clears throat> the planning processes at the Met Council, they're going to have to do it online because we won't be meeting until after that review takes place. So what are your thoughts about that, uh, that sequence from a process standpoint, Elaine? Well, the review is going through right now, the, uh, December 8th and 9th is the review of the materials um, of our processes. So it's, the feedback is part of the review process. So it's not after, it's part of that process. Okay. All right. So um, I wonder if would folks be comfortable extending our meeting for an extra half hour uh, in mid-December to accommodate uh, uh, FHWA uh, and FTA to make a presentation to us so we could ask, uh, we could see what they're thinking about in terms of the adequacy of the processes at the Met Council with respect to their uh, role as the MPO. Is that okay? Get that done. And we we'll try to move promptly through uh, the rest of the December agenda. Elaine, what else is on the agenda for December other than our final work on uh, on the regional solicitation? Was the approval of the Metropolitan Airports Commission CIP and a, I think a TIP amendment. And, but there are, we aren't going to put any information items on there, so that should keep the meeting somewhat shorter. Okay. All right. And have you had any indication from the from the MAC as to the length of that presentation? Um, in the past, it's been we've kept it down because Lisa Fries will do the presentation unless we have them do a longer one. Okay. Um, depends on what the wishes are. We could probably keep it a short presentation. All right, and Member Crimmins, have you heard anything from uh, the, the MAC folks about uh, how long they need for a presentation or whether they want to be involved in the presentation or just have Chair Freeze make that presentation? They probably will submit it to uh, Chair Freeze, but I know because of the COVID, the, the budget is down and they dropped several items, so it should be a little shorter. Okay, all right. Well, I think we can manage all of this in, in December then, so we'll 
we'll schedule that FHWA uh, FTA uh, meeting for the end of our regular tab meeting in December. And then, um, Elaine, to the extent that we have any departing TAB members uh, in December, we should think about celebrating those folks a little bit, too, and thanking them for their their great service. I know we got Mayor Mary, and there may be others as well, uh, Commissioner Malushnik. Um, so I want to make sure they get appropriate recognition. You and I can talk about that offline. Uh, and I think that completes my report. And then I'll jump over to Mike, uh, Member Barnes is... Member Barnes, do you have anything to report from for MnDOT? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple items. One, uh, first, uh, I'm not sure if folks have heard, but uh, our Deputy Scott Peterson is going to be retiring from MnDOT here in December. So Kim Collins uh, will be or is taken over then as the, our new Deputy Commissioner kind of from the admin um, HR side. We have Nancy Daubenberger from the Chief Engineer side of it. So. Um, so for those that know Scott Peterson, he's going to be retiring. Uh, update again from the last time, uh, the Highway 5 by the airport now is open. Overall, our construction season <clears throat> is pretty well wrapped up. We got a, a few, some you'll still see some projects where there's some ramps on some interchanges still being worked on and a, a few items because of that early, early snow, but all indications now if the weather stays the way that it's been forecasted hopefully that um, we'll be able to wrap up but the things that are there are are um, pretty minor so it's been a, a good season overall considering everything that's been going on and we do have the, the freight the minnesota highway freight program solicitation now we'll find out results in december and um, this is the the freight funding that was for fiscal year or for the years 23 24 and 25 so when we get the information we'll we'll get it to a lane um, same with uh, November, the transportation budget forecast. We'll get something out this this month. So again, we'll 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 probably hear something before the next meeting. So we'll get the information to Elaine to send, like she does, which is works out great. And then our statewide multimodal transportation plan and our state highway investment plan, the Minship, is going to be starting to kick off here in 2021. So we'll be engaging Tab and the committees, so there'll be more information. Uh, on that, but just a heads up that we'll be starting on that. So other than that, unless there's questions, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Member Barnes. Questions for Member Barnes? Anything MnDOT related? Anybody wondering why MnDOT now has uh, lazy boys in their offices? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, I just got a quick question for Member Barnes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, Mike, I just saw something about like there's a hundred and twenty five million dollar shortfall for MnDOT. Will that affect things this year or is that moving into the future? Well, that part was just from reporting of stuff that we have been already saying when there was the the gap that uh, we've been uh, forecasting and it actually was bigger at the at the initial part, but we've been working in combination of having part of the the reserve side or the, the on the front highway fund balance. And then also we've been doing measures within the department. So this, what you heard or seen is no different than what we've already been saying. It was just now put into an article. So it's um, unless the forecast, which we're hoping will at least stay the same or hopefully be a little better then that's in some ways kind of older news per se. Um, Okay. from what we've been talking about so i kind of saw it as a flash that this was happening so that's what where i was okay. so thanks for clarifying sounds good all right thank you any other questions for member barnes all right very good uh member b1 uh mpca anything to report sure mr chair members um just a couple of continuing updates on um things that i've reported on before with our Volkswagen monies, we're continuing to grant um, in that in that program. We have a new grant, uh, $170,000 in grant dollars, small amount when we're talking about what the numbers that we talk about in this group. But um, this is to install uh, 22 additional um, electric vehicle level two charging stations in public places and or workplace locations. 
Um, there's new incentives within this program for EV charging stations that are using clean renewable energy rather than fossil fuel generated electricity for those chargers. Um, there's also a focus on advancing transportation equity and um, points are awarded for these projects in areas of environmental justice, where that's a concern, vulnerable populations in areas of, of um, increased air pollution. Um, the second update is just that our Clean Cars Minnesota rulemaking continues. Uh, we're continuing to prepare cost benefit analysis materials for that, and we're still anticipating publishing a draft rule on the Clean Cars Minnesota in the fall of 2021, um, or excuse me, no, it, early in 2021, um, early in 2021. And then the last thing is just a, just a reminder that there is a pretty extensive um, climate sub cabinet in state government. Um, and if this team or the TAC would be interested in a, any kind of presentation, to kind of an overview of what that climate sub cabinet is doing, uh, we would be happy to arrange that through the MPCA. So thank you, my... and I think we will try to arrange that. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that invitation. Would you go back to that hundred and seventy thousand in grants for EV charging stations? What what was that amount of money supposed to provide in terms of the number of charging stations? Well, it's it's it will help um, to install up to twenty two additional. Dual okay. port, dual port electric vehicle level two charging stations. So these are not the highest powered, the fastest, but um, they're level two charging stations in and public how, places and workplaces. All right, and uh, for uh, either the public sector or private sector entities that may be interested in applying for those grants, they just go to your website. Yes. Yeah. Under. Um, um, looking under the, the looking for the Volkswagen grants, um, that I think that you'd be able to find it there. Okay. All right. Very good. Questions for Member Bewin from TAB members? All right. Let's move on to uh, Member Crimmins and get an update on things at the MAC. Member Crimmins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, as always, there's awards. Uh, the MAC, we won Best Airport in 2019 for the size of airport. That's the fourth consecutive year we won that. And we also received an award from the Director General of Airport Council International. We've made it to the General's Role of Excellence. Only one of seven airports globally have made that designation. So they're looking at the, the, our past success, and they're letting us build on that. Uh, next is, I don't know if you heard, we have a COVID testing site now at the airport. It's in the blue ramp, and it's free to Minnesota citizens. And they say the test will take about 15 minutes, so the parking is free. But you pull it to the blue ramp and go to the second level, and then you'll be tested, and you'll receive your results by email in 24 hours. Now, the, the site was set up for 1,000 people. The first day, we had 1,500 tested. So it looks like the word is out, and people are very interested in getting a free test. And then we have our flights. Our flights are still down, eight, and passengers 68% from 2019. But it is improving. It was at one time, you remember, when it first hit, it was down 95%. And then the TSA predicts that travelers over Thanksgiving will be about 6.9 million across the United States. The bulk of the traveling is going to be by car. The large percentage of people traveling for Thanksgiving is going to be by vehicle. But TSA is predicting 6.9 million travelers over Thanksgiving holidays. And we've also started a parking program to where you get $7 off parking if you stay at least seven days in the ramp or if it's over a holiday season which is still too soon for now for thanksgiving maybe not but we'll see Th three days before the holiday and three days after the holiday you'll you'll get seven dollars a day off parking 
So right now you'll get parking for like $19 a day with that schedule. But you have to pre-book your parking in order to get the rate. And other than that, we're seeing things picking up. I know our budget we just talked about earlier, our construction budget or capital budget for next year is going to be reduced. And I believe the, the staff is ready to submit that budget to the legislature and to the Met Council in the month of December for review and discussion. But we've done a lot of things. We've cut back on a lot of things. So in our inbound road, as long as Highway 5 is open, the inbound road to the airport has been redone. It's all been poured in concrete. One lane is closed because they're working on lighting. But other than that, they'll be done shortly, and then that inbound road will be opened up 100%. So with Highway 5 and the inbound road, it should be easy access. Parking is picking up. Every month we're receiving more people parking at the airport, so that's improving. But other than that, Mr. Chair, that's all I have, except for any questions. Questions for Member Timmons? Mr. Chair? Uh, Frank yes. Boyles? Frank, yes, Member Boyles. Uh, Mr. Kermans, uh, you said 6.9 million travelers, I think. Um, I guess that's in all forms. Back in the old days, what was the normal number? Oh, I wouldn't know. I, I would say 6.9 million. It's probably at least 50% to 60% down. But that's Thank across you. the United States. So it's probably been about 12 to 15 million over a typical Thanksgiving. Gotcha. Thanks so much. All right. Oh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks so much, Carl. I always look forward to all of these reports because I get to get up to speed. Thanks so much for supporting that uh, that testing at the airport. I have a number of friends that I want to. They're going to use that. Um, anyways, Carl, I'm curious because I have a number of friends who want to fly, but they said, you know, I, I'm now convinced that airplanes are okay, but it's going. It's the airports. You know, it's it's the airport. You know, coming and going from the planes. What can you say about airport, you know, distancing? Are people pretty good about it, or how is that How is that going, just if you want to uh, relieve any fears that people are having about that? Of course, um, people sure, are going to sure. feel what they want, just if you want to comment. Sure. We, uh, we met with the uh, cleaning companies. We have a schedule for naturally for the bathrooms to be cleaned, and they're clean X amount of times a day. Well, we reduced that schedule by 30% and then moved, since we have fewer passengers, we don't need to be hitting those bathrooms or toilet rooms that often a day. So now we've moved those people into the general areas. So they're out in the gate areas and we have special crews set up. There's three people crews going around the terminals being highly visible so people could see them. They're cleaning the high touch places. And at night they're going around with those misting machines and they're spraying down the terminals, the seats, the floors, the walls, everything that's visible in during the evening hour. So we even put a crew on at night. So I think if, if you come to the airport, you'll see people cleaning, and which is what we were trying to do. We wanted to make sure passengers saw the cleaning crews so they could feel comfortable when they're going through the airport. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate hearing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, yes. Commissioner. Never again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Crimmins, uh, I'm seriously taking notes for the uh, TAP liaison report to the Transportation Committee, and, and I will tell you that your report is probably the most highly desired. So uh, you've got a lot of fans over there. Uh, <laughs> two things. Uh, to get to the Blue Ram testing site, is it necessary to go through security? No, sir. You go into when you're driving with your car. You go to the parking area, okay. and then when you when you once you enter parking, you put your credit card in. The gate goes up, and you go up mm -hmm. in the blue ramp, and you park there. But because you're on the text the uh, testing level, and you're going to have to park on level four and take the elevator down to level two. Level mm -hmm. two is where the testing is. After you test, they're going to give you a card that you plug in when you're exiting. So you don't have to pay for parking okay. because it's because I don't know how long the wait's going to be, but the test itself per individual is 15 minutes. It, you could be an hour if it's overloaded with people. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And but this is a show up. up. They're not going to charge. This is a show up and get tested, not a an, an appointment. Well, they say if you call, they would appreciate <laughs> if you call ahead of time so they can let you know. Don't come at eleven. Come at twelve. They're trying to space it out a little bit. But okay. you don't have to. You could just show up. There's no appointments necessary. Okay. Do you have a phone number to call? Uh, it would be. It, it would be on the website, on the, on the airport website. I don't have the phone number with me here. Okay. But then you'll get your results. You'll have to give them your email address because then they'll email you 24 hours after your test for your results. Okay, thank you. The second question is, uh, you said passengers from 2019. Uh, is that employment or is that just passengers, passenger numbers? You said down 68%. Oh, that's that's the whole total, the pass through and the ones that are leaving here. Okay. Number of passengers leaving the airports. We have some, okay. like you say, from other airports coming in and changing right. planes, but the the flight numbers are down, and the flights are down about thirty five percent from last year. Okay, and, and thank you, Amity, for the, uh, not only the hair but sending that information. <laughs> And then one other thing I forgot, Mr. Chair, Delta yeah. is going to start flying to Honolulu on Sunday. So, and since Honolulu or Hawaii has stopped quarantine, you can fly on Delta. There's going to be two or three flights a day, but you have to prove you've tested negative within the past two uh, two days mm -hmm. before you can board the Delta flight. So just to let you know, that, that's something that's available now. Mr. Chair, may I can I can't believe you missed telling people they had a chance to go to Hawaii. <laughs> well, Sunday, it, I don't know if the planes are going to be full. <laughs> uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Crimmins, on that yeah. to Honolulu, is, is the uh, pre-boarding COVID testing only for that flight or any, any and all Delta flights? Oh, I don't know. They just mentioned that you're not going to get into Honolulu without a, okay. a record that you, you're tested negative in the past okay. two days. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Member Degan. There's some good information, Elaine, coming into the chat room. Would you make sure that we have that information preserved so that we can send that out, those links to various things? Yes, I'm sending them as they come yeah. out. Great, thank you. Uh, all right. All um, right. Anything else for Member Crimmins? Then we'll go on to Deb Barber, our Met Council representative, Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of things today. Um, one of them is this afternoon at Met Council, um, we are uh, moving to adopt the 2020 update to the uh, 24 TPP and accept the public comment. Um, as you all know, the, the update began last January and was intended to be a minor update, really focusing on updating the project status, um, adding new planning studies to the work program and making minor revenue and spending adjustments. The main, major reason for the update was to get the plan schedule aligned with the work that will be taking place um, on the 2015 plans over the next few years. Um, in March, um, with the COVID pandemic, we did determine to continue with the update, but we did want to did build in extra language about um, the potential transportation impacts of COVID. So I know you've all been involved with that uh, work along the way. Just want to say thank you very much, and I think we're hitting a, a very uh, positive milestone this afternoon. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was you all should have gotten a notice um, uh, from Elaine regarding the um, second transit service allocation study workshop. Um, that workshop is to take place on December 3rd from 3 to 6. So um, check your meal email if you haven't registered um, uh, go ahead and you can still sign up for it and uh, there'll be information that will be coming out um, to anybody who has registered for that um, uh, workshop. Thank you. Uh, Member Barber. Thank you. And any questions for Member Barber? Yes, uh, Member Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Of course, I have a question. Um, I do. Could, could you say a little bit more about what role Metro Transit Police are going to be playing in enforcing the mask order on the buses and trains? Uh, well, we haven't, um, like, there's, um, I, I don't know that we have a necessarily enforcement role. We're really pushing out more and more messaging of the requirements to wear masks. Um, and 
because we're a little further down and a little more, um, I would say uh, everyone, everyone's getting pandemic weary that we're making sure that we're like going back out with new messaging, um, um, really trying to um, put out um, repeatedly um, the need to wear masks on the transit system. Um, it's, uh, I think that that's just something that any organization right now um, and has a role in the public, has a responsibility to do, and we really felt we needed to kind of refresh the messaging to make sure that we're still seeing compliance. All right, go Mr. Ahead. Foster, go ahead and continue on, please. Thanks. Thank you all. But I, I saw an email, I think it was a writer alert about how education is, of course, the priority, and then they may be moving to kicking people off of the buses and trains if they're not wearing masks. I'm wondering if Metro Transit has explored options like handing out masks. We have done a, like that instead of just. Yeah. We have done, we have been handing out masks and our operators have masks to hand out. Um, and uh, we've actually done a lot of community events where we're handing out masks um, in general, and we'll continue to do that as well. Um, I think that we'd rather have the riders riding safely um, um, and protecting each other than have anybody um, not get, have an opportunity to ride the transit system, so. Member Foster. Yeah. Sorry, thank you, I appreciate that. This is unrelated, but um, as far as I know, it is illegal in Minnesota to drive while you are on the phone. I think that's the law and it is um, super disconcerting and disturbing to see member look on the phone while he's <laughs> driving. As, as long I just as wanted he's to hands that. free. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I don't drive, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a hands-free policy. And so you can be on the phone. You just can't be holding it while you're doing it. I'm sorry, was my name brought up? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I'm parked right now. All good. <laughs> thanks for clarifying that. All right, any additional questions? All right. Thank you, Member Barber. Um, TAC Chair Freeze, did you have anything you wanted to report? Well, uh, the one thing I should report is that we're in the process of uh, rotating the TAC Chair. So after the December meeting, um, I will probably be hanging up my shingle as TAC, TAC Chair, and I want it, if I don't get a chance then, I want it to. I'll let you know I've been very appreciative of being involved with this esteemed group of individuals, and it's been fun um, to participate in your meetings over the last three years. Well, we'll see you next month, and uh, add her to the celebration list, Elaine. That's uh, something worth recognizing, too. That's a, it's another undertaking as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. so we appreciate it. Chair Freeze, you've done uh, excellent work on behalf of the TAC and for the TAB. Um, all right, so we've got some minutes. We should have amended the agenda to improve the minute, uh, uh, have approval of the minutes involved as well, but we've got the minutes uh, from October 21, 2020. Does anyone wish to uh, modify the minutes in any way or provide any correction? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as shown. Heyman, Roland, move approval. Anderson, second. All right. We've got a mover and a second on the minutes of October 21, 2020. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to approval of the minutes of October 21, 2020. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Boyles. Aye. Crimmins. Aye. Dugan. Aye. Foster. Aye. Markinson. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Giuliani Stevens. Aye. Patel. Aye. Heyman Rowland. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Yes. Hollinshead. Aye. Karwaski. Lindeke. Aye. Rook.
Matt? Malichnik? Aye. Bewin? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Narayanan? Aye. Petrick? Reich? Aye. Sanger? Aye. Schember? Aye. Stephenson? Aye. Swanson? Tolbert? Yes. Ulrich? Aye. Windshadow? Mark? Yes. Washi? Jeff? He was there earlier. Jeff Washi? Mayor Washi? Hmm. Okay. All right. All right, uh, minutes are approved. Uh, we don't have any uh, consent or uh, action items to deal with in the business portion of the agenda today. We're going to move right on to uh, the information section of the agenda, and we've got an arterial BRT update that uh, Robin Kaufman and Katie Roth are going to provide uh, and tell us a little bit about the next steps for them, and then we're going to move into these funding scenarios and try to narrow those down for the uh, December meeting. Uh, in a couple different ways. We'll talk about that in a bit, but in, first we will welcome uh, Robin Kaufman and Katie Roth to do the uh, Network Next uh, Arterial BRT update for us. Great, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, TAB members. I'm Katie Roth, Assistant Director of BRT Projects at Metro Transit. With me today is Robin Kaufman, our Director of Administration. We were prepared to um, share this update with you about engagement around arterial DRT planning within Network Next during the October meeting, um, but you know, are happy to be here instead in November, um, having been bumped for time last month. And in the in ensuing months, we've also had a chance to prepare um, more of a distillation of our engagement activities over the past couple of months. So we've got a more robust update than we were planning to bring you a month ago. So good news on that front. <laughs> um, I'll give just an overview of where we are in the process, hand things off to Robin to walk through the engagement summary, and then I will tie things up with our next steps toward the end. So just starting here on this slide, I wanted to um, remind you all where we are in this process. Within Network Next, a broader effort toward identifying a 2040 vision for the transit network, um, for Metro Transit's network rather, we are also doing work now to identify the next arterial BRT lines. We started earlier this year with a group of about 20 that we then screened through a technical evaluation to identify about 10 most promising candidates to advance. We took out 11 corridors for community feedback in the months of September and October and are sharing the results of that initial feedback today. Our next steps will be to sort those corridors into three tiers of near-term, mid-term, and longer-term priorities, share those for public review next month, and ultimately um, re excuse me, end up in the network next process um, with recommendations for the F, G, and H lines before advancing the F line for TAB's funding consideration in the spring. Next slide, please. Uh, as a reminder, we had for those initial 11 corridors that we took out for public review included the set shown here. Um, so the engagement activities that Robin will be speaking more to um, were focused on these 11 corridors and gathering feedback from community around them. I do want to point out, however, that during this time of, of stakeholder engagement, we've also had more conversation with Ramsey County. And if we look to the next slide, we'll see what we plan to take forward following this um, phase of the study. So um, as a result of more conversation with Ramsey County, we've identified that the um, best path forward for the West 7th slash White Bear Avenue corridor that we had been analyzing for arterial BRT would be to instead conduct more detailed analysis of that with the Riverview process that is advancing right now in the major investment work that Ramsey County is leading. Um, so going forward, our map will look more like this, but I do want to caution that the slides you're about to see will include West 7th and White Bear as it was part of that initial community engagement feedback that we undertook earlier this year. 
Um, so with that, I will hand things off to Robin for the next slide and beyond. Thank Sorry. you. Oh, Ms. Kaufman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Again, um, I'm Robin Kaufman, Director of Administration, and um, I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview and summary of what we heard through the phase one engagement. And so just to re uh, refresh, we went out with basically three questions asking the community, you know, what are your priorities? How would you prioritize the 11 corridors? Um, we, at, we gave them an opportunity to just um, kind of free form and, and provide their comments on that. And then we asked them to prioritize the three, um, the three principles generally of equity, growing ridership, supporting a transit oriented lifestyle and supporting long-term sustainable operations. So those were the goals, um, the principles we were focusing on. Um, we set an initial goal of 2000 responses and we're targeting um, to have, um, trying targeting to have a response of 45% um, representing black, indigenous or people of color. Next slide, please. So we set out with a variety of strategies. I am not gonna read in just of time, I'm not gonna read all of the slides, but we used a variety or all the details here, but we used a variety of ele um, electronic communications, mass emails to large, you know, some of our distribution lists, our go-to card users and our app users, especially those that use these 11 corridors. Um, we did a lot on social media, including at asking specific questions about specific routes. We, um, we um, did ads in um, two ethnic media, the Spokesman Recorder and B2E Sabor. Um, we did a lot of shifts. We had 18 shifts where folks were out at our um, busy stations and transit centers surveying people. And then we did reach out to community organizations um, and also help support uh, city, and city and county partners who wanted to help um, get, the, get the information out. Next slide, please. So we were very successful in receiving responses. We actually received um, over 260 or 2,600 surveys. Um, 125 of those were in person and about 2,500 of those were online. Um, we did not quite achieve our goal of 45% uh, um, BIPOC representation. Uh, we actually were uh, achieved only 22%. Uh, you can see on the slide, all the charts on the right side of the slide, the lower pie chart shows the breakdown of ethnicity and race by um, of our riders pre-COVID. And then you can see the um, breakdown of um, race and ethnicity of, of the communities that we were able to engage uh, through this process. Probably the, the most notable difference there is um, the Black and African American community. They're definitely uh, were underrepresented in this um, in this survey, and so we've taken some lessons learned and and um, are applying those to our to future phases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other thing is we were targeting to make sure that we had a good representation of the region, and so um, we were when we surveyed people, we asked them for their zip codes. So you can see here. Um, the concentration and, and numbers of uh, responses, green indicating more, more responses and orange or red um, indicating fewer responses. You can see that they generally followed the, um, the outline of the different corridors. Next slide, please. So what we heard, um, nearly half of the respondents ranked advancing equity considerations as their top priority. That was a clear, um, clear leader. Um, we found that priority differs slightly um, if you um, look at it by race or ethnicity. Um, we also noticed that there is a difference if you are able to um, filter it by how frequent uh, people use transit. We heard um, most of the people, we asked people how they heard about it. We're you know, trying to learn how to best communicate during COVID and our changing circumstances. So we asked people how they'd heard. Um, we found that most people were hearing either email or newsletter or social media. And I wanna um, thank um, TAB members and, and our stakeholders. Uh, we actually asked and found that 14% of the responses were from um, city or county um, social media or emails. So I just wanna do a shout out and really thank, thank all of you and all the city and county um, counties that helped us get the word out because it definitely made a difference in getting responses. Um, we found that some um, engagement strategies were more effective than others. Um, we only did ads in Spokesman Recorder and Vita Isabor. 
in previous engagement, we'd actually done an article and we got much better success. So um, as we go into phase two, we're gonna be doing um, more of the um, articles to go along with the ads. Um, we did in morning survey or we did surveying in the morning and it's definitely not as busy a time. And so we're gonna be doing more surveying um, in the evening or maybe midday when the ridership is higher. We got mass emails. We sent out a mass email to all of our um, app and go to card users. It was about 40,000 people that use those lines. And um, we got 900 surveys in one night. It was fabulous. Um, but um, again, the numbers are high, but it may not be reflective of our riders at this time. Um, and we also found that people, it's really hard to engage people in person about long range plans when they're, you know, running to the, get their bus or, or something. It's really hard to say. So what would you like to see in five years? Uh, next slide, please. So just to show a few charts, um, as far as what we heard, um, this is a chart showing all of the respondents and you can see that the Lindale Johnson uh, Nicollet Avenue were um, by far the, the highest um, highest top one or highest priority corridors followed by some of the other routes, um, Central, Como, Maryland, and um, the West 7th White Bear Avenue that um, Katie mentioned earlier, and then followed slightly by the Broadway Cedar. So that's all respondents. Next slide, please. And as I was mentioning, there was some difference based on race and ethnicity. And so we just wanted to take a look at how some of these corridors um, may have differed um, depending on race and ethnicity. So um, not to go into too much detail on this, but you can see that there are some routes that um, had higher um, interest um, by different, um, different ethnicities. And next slide, please. As far as um, priorities, you can see there, um, this is showing the four priorities and you can see the one on the left that's advancing equity and re reducing re regional racial disparities and a clear leader um, for there. And then you can see that supporting a transit oriented lifestyle was the, the uh, runner up. And again, this is for all respondents. And next slide, please. And again, we just wanted to see if there's any differences um, between um, by race or ethnicity. And so you can see um, just depending, um, there's different uh, levels. The um, advancing equity is always the leader, but you can see some of them, they're more, um, more consistent across um, versus um, somewhere that race and ethnic um, equity is a, is a higher, um, higher priority. Next slide, please. Um, and then as, as far as how people heard about the survey, um, um, we did look at how I mentioned how people look, uh, heard about the survey. Most people did hear either from the website, a newsletter, social media, or an email. We did just note that there were a few differences based on um, race, and, race and ethnicity. And so as we um, you know, try to especially target black and African-American um, individuals, just to make sure that we get a, a larger representation there, we can focus on, on more of those um, activities. We also notice that for the indigenous American, native Alaskan, and um, also the black African American community, um, um, significant number of responses were from the in-person survey. So it really highlights the need to be out um, engaging, engaging people at transit centers and in the public. Next slide, please. And then as far as phase two, I've kind of hinted at it a little bit. Um, we've already, um, we've learned some lessons as I've mentioned and um, we're building those into our engagement plans. We're well underway with the planning. We've, um, we're gonna be doing uh, detailed articles with ads and social media with um, five ethnic media. So I'm excited about that. Um, that'll run in both uh, December and January. Um, we're uh, continuing to do our, our routine um, communications as far as mass emails and uh, online survey, um, as well as uh, working on updating our website. And um, we're also trying to come up with some questions that make this more tangible and how people can engage a little bit more engaging for folks. So as we're doing all of this, um, we're getting kind of putting plans in place and we'll be ready to hit the streets in early, um, early to mid-December. I think that's my last slide. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it back over to Katie. All right. Thank you. Robin, I just have two slides here to wrap things up with our next steps. 
Um, so all of this feedback that Robin has shared, we are going to be bringing into and helping shape the weights of the various principles in our technical evaluation, um, reflecting the emphasis on equity that we have heard from community members engaged in this process, and pairing that also with more conversations with cities and counties around the initial readiness considerations for these corridors with other efforts going on in the region um, and, and how we should be bringing forward each of these priorities. Um, as I mentioned, our next step will be to return to community in December with these three tiers. Um, but I do also want to note that as we develop arterial BRT in these corridors, engagement doesn't end in Network Next. And so we are we have more engagement in this process, but we certainly know that folks, um, in addition to thinking about kind of that longer range network planning, are, are much more likely to engage with projects as they're advancing. And so we'll be continuing to develop engagement plans um, as these projects emerge from this process. Next slide, please. And then just as we look toward the F-line selection process and ultimately um, how Metro Transit and the council will bring an F-line to TAB for its consideration um, for investment, uh, our next step will be to um, connect back with TAB and I think we'll be coordinating with Elaine on um, how to do this across the end of the year and into early next year. But we'll be prepared for that in mid-December as we, as Robin mentioned, we'll be taking out um, for public engagement these tiers during the, um, the week of December 7th and December 14th, beginning that outreach and engagement period and really asking folks how we should select the F-line among the top corridors here. Um, ultimately, we will be bringing the results of the Network Next BRT planning process to the Met Council um, with a recommended action in March of 2021 followed by um, emerging with an F-line for TAB consideration in April of 2021. I've got the website here um, for more information and certainly we'll be pushing out the um, engagement information as December rolls around as well. Echoing Robin's thanks for your efforts and your team's efforts in helping us engage the region around these priorities. And with that, um, Chair Hovland, we'll stand for any questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Roth. Uh, questions from Tab members for either Ms. Roth or Ms. Kaufman. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Commissioner Gotel. Um, I did, yes. And I just, first of all, I want to say thank you for all the hard work that this was into. And I know that you had some challenges. So I, I really am excited to see that you're going back at the BIPOC community. So I think that's very worthwhile. Thank you for doing that. And let us know mm -hmm. in the county how we can help you. We're engaging in those same communities. We'd like to help. Um, you know, when I, I've had some really interesting conversations about uh, um, some of the, I'm a suburban mayor, right? All suburban about the differences that they see the value in having all these, these lines that are these BRT lines that are, or along corridors that are already successful. And they also see the worthiness of making sure that they're successful because of the dollars that are attached to this. But then on the other hand, we have second ring suburbs that are looking at, they have uh, um, equity issues as well, looking at how do I get on there? How do I get in the long range planning for this? What what could be the steps? And I don't think we've developed that. This might be something for us to have a further conversation about. How do we develop something that would be American Boulevard along serving that corridor for those types of work, but also those workers that live along there, which are the BIPOC community and um, a lot of them have poverty issues, except that they don't have enough ridership yet because they don't have enough bus service yet to be able to get there. So they're relying on cars and stuff. So this would be a great help to the community. Maybe there needs to be a, a path and it maybe it's, it's different than this. It's a different way to get there. So I just wanted to put that comment and those statements out there because I'm hearing from my other suburbs who really want to see some of this stuff move even further out. They're so excited to see how popular, how well this works, what it does for economic development, and they just want to see more. So that's my comment. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McGuire. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm happy to follow my colleague, uh, Commissioner Gattel, because I also represent a suburban area that doesn't see as much of this, uh, of the transit and the, of the service as we would like out in our area. <clears throat> Although we're happy for our little red line BRT that we've got. Um, and uh, I'm just going to ask the same kind of questions as, and, and thank you for all of your work, certainly. I appreciate it all. Um, you know, you had said that you wanted to do more outreach to the diverse communities, the BIPOC communities, and I, I certainly support that. 
So I, I do, you know, sort of, if you could comment a little more on these numbers, you know, so you take numbers of people that generally take transit. So you're, you're talking to people that are already doing it on in areas that may already have transit. So we may not be getting as much response from people that from areas that don't have as much of that. And then if you're, if we're putting out this call, is it people that are just more well organized that are responding? Because I'm concerned that some of these BIPOC communities or these disenfranchised communities who really need transit and really need this, that they're maybe not inclined to fill out a survey. And so you may not get the numbers on some of these lines that that may, you know, you may otherwise get because they're just not the they're just not filling out surveys. So I'm um, just just curious about when you're um you know, this is very um numbers based and that's what we have to go on. So of course that's that's what we do have, and I, I totally think we need to have public input. So if, if you could just comment on how, I, how I'm thinking about this and whether we're getting, you know, the right people weighing in. I mean, we're getting the right people weighing in, but how do we get more people weighing in um, from all of these different areas? Ms. Kaufman, you're on mute. And while you're unmuting, I do want to add my support to Commissioner Gattel's uh, question about, you know, how do you get on the long range radar? And I think that's a great conversation that this group could have is, you know, how, how do communities get even longer range on this? So thank you. Yeah, um, um, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, that's a great question. Um, we're, you know, learning, uh, especially in this new environment where a lot of this is virtual. Um, and so we are trying, I um, would love to hear any suggestions uh, that we have. I did present to the equity, the council's equity advisory committee last month and again last night as well to get some of their ideas and some of the suggestions they had was, you know, like going out to, um, to the Met Council's Section 8 housing um, voucher holders, or maybe even like working with the counties and some of the public uh, public um, housing, and so working with them and seeing if they'd be willing to share the email or you know um, push out an email with the link to the survey in it, um, and so if that's something that um, counties are interested in. I'd be more than happy to follow up with with your staff on that. Um, certainly, um, working with each of the cities and the counties um, to to include, we're going to do a packet again. So we'll do all of the the, the articles, the graphics, the maps, um, our social media plan. And so, if you want to help push those out to your constituents or include an article in your December or January, um, the, oh, the survey period is going to be from um, December 10th to January 20th. And so we certainly we've got the materials drafted already and are trying to work with um, with some of the local papers um, to get to get them published. But we can certainly provide that to your communication staff as well. Um, so if you want if it's you know time to get into your your emails or um, certainly city council members, county commissioners are welcome to to retweet or push some of this out to their constituents as well. Um, trying to think of other. Um, other suggestions or ideas. Um, we'll, we've got like our mass email list and our, we do use our Met Council, you know, our broad Met Council newsletter, which does go out to the entire region, not just to our transit users. Um, trying to think of other suggestions or ideas that folks may have. Certainly open to ideas. So Mr. certainly Mr. Yeah, the, to, to um, Ms. Coffin's suggestion, uh, to the extent TAP members have ideas about communication, certainly get it, get that information to them. Commissioner, do you have a follow on? Just thank you for that. And yes, our counties are all doing this kind of work with all of these different diverse communities. I'm sure cities are too. So yeah, get it out to us and we can, you know, get it out um, to our people that are already out in the communities because we're, we're doing the same kind of thing, trying to get the best feedback we can from our from our diverse communities. So um, thank you for, yeah, send it send it out widely. And, and you probably already sent it to us, yeah. send it to yeah. us again so we can get it out there and um, and get it into our processes. All right, we're gonna go, we're gonna go next to a member Foster and then Commissioner Malusnik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think some of what I was gonna ask has already been answered around the coordination <laughs> between council members, like city staff, council members, uh, county commissioners and 
Metro Transit and the communication about like filling out the surveys, where are the places? And it sounds like that hasn't been happening, which is unfortunate. Um, I think there's things like from the council members, it sounds like it hasn't been happening. Like our email blasts going out to your constituent list around this, what is the engagement from council members ends to their bases around transit needs and transportation needs? That's my question. Yeah. Ms. Kaufman or sure. Roth? Um, Mr. Chair and, and committee member, um, are you, Maybe just to clarify, are you asking about the Met Council member communication? Or are you asking about the city, city and county? Um, city and county. Official? Okay, thank city you. And county. <laughs> um, I know that we sent out a packet um, last time with with this information. Maybe when we send it out this time, maybe it would be, and I think it goes to city staff. It might be good to be really explicit in there that we encourage them to share that with their city, their mayors, their city council members and their aides and, and helping them use it for their, um, to, to send out to their constituents and use in their newsletters as well, like specifically suggest that as, as an idea or something that we'd recommend. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cole Hineker has a response as well for Commissioner McGuire. Cole? Yeah, and, and to, to Commissioner Goodell as well, you know, I, I heard a little bit about how do we get on the long range radar for transit investment. And, and one thing I wanted to just highlight was we made, we tried to make a really big push with comp plans this year to get cities to talk about transit opportunities in their community and land use and how it relates to the to long term vision for transit in their communities. And I just ask, you know, that's a great place to start. I would say we didn't see quite as good as a response as we had hoped. And so one of our first steps is to look at a city's comp plan, which is a really easy way to say, here is where we think transit could benefit our community. And, you know, starting there and giving us a sense as, as a city is where you think those opportunities are. And I know that was also, you know, factored into to the arterial BRT analysis at this phase as one of the criteria. So I think we're always looking at comp plans as sort of our, first cut at what your community's aspirations and commitments to transit are, especially as it relates to your land use plan. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Henniker. Uh, and then on to Commissioner Malushnik. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, all these comments are very good. I just wanted to note and recognize that um, since I've come on the tab and been involved with the Met Council over the years, this is a marked marked improvement over the type of engagement and the outreach that was done before, particularly in this area of transit. And I just think we ought to um, acknowledge that uh, we're moving in the right direction anyway. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner, for that observation. It's an important one. Chair Hovland? Yes. Chair Hovland, this is Sue Sanger. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, add on to what Commissioner Gattel and Commissioner McGuire said. Um, when I first looked at the map of uh, the top 11 options, I was a little distressed, frankly, to see that there was nothing in the western suburbs or the southwestern suburbs at all. And I am concerned that the outreach effort maybe that you've done has been fine as far as it goes, but I'm not certain I understand how you have reached out to people who aren't living along the existing corridors that you were thinking about. And I'm also concerned that putting things, for example, on next door, I'm guessing that a lot of people out in the suburbs have no idea what ABRT is or what it stands for or what the benefits are. And so you might want to consider in the future kind of taking a step back to explain what do we even mean by this? Why is this beneficial to get people to um, engage further? Member thanks, thanks for that good observation. Uh, Ms. Kaufman? Yes, um, Mr. Chair and, and committee member, that's an excellent observation. I was um, I did a few shifts of um, um, on-site survey work and um, at, was asking people, well, what do you think of ABRT? And like you said, a lot of people weren't familiar with it. 
And so we actually are one of our um, one of our strategies in the in phase two is to do a little um, video about what ABRT is and what are the benefits and and how does it work. So that's actually going to be part of our phase two, and we'll have that on the website. So Good. Um, thank you for that suggestion. And um, as far as reaching out to some of the other areas, um, we'll um, I'll I'll think about that and see how we can um, how we can do how we can do that. Maybe reaching out, for example, to like some of the the local like the Sun Sun Post type newspapers um, and seeing if they would be able to do do the same article. Can I give one other suggestion? Yep. Mem Member Sanger, please go ahead. Most of the communities, in my understanding, have a local human rights commission that perhaps directly reaching out to human rights commissions in each of the communities might help foster more connections, particularly with um, the BIPOC community. Thank right. you. Excellent. Thank you, Excellent. Mr. Singer. And then I think member Dugan had his hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, before, I don't want to forget this. But, uh, I'm always taken with Commissioner Maluchnik's uh, view of the of the metro as one one area. Of, I mean, if there's a there's a there's a poster child for a inclusivity, it's uh, certainly Randy. So, and you will be missed, sir. Uh, it was you know you yeah I'm just always impressed with that. Uh, if I may put in a plug for the December third uh, planning session for transit, uh, many of us, Mayor Mary and uh, Ms. Barber and Mary Jo attended the first one. I think that was back what, spring, early winter, maybe. I'm not sure. But the difficulty of putting together a transit system, you know, from the ground up and deciding priorities. Priorities. I have, you know, the, the priorities that, that the folks surveyed have answered are certainly valuable. Uh, I'll say a little concerning that no one looks sustaining it as a priority because without sustaining it all it all falls and and also uh transit oriented development which is touted by everyone as limiting uh, you know dependence on individual vehicles uh, so I, sometimes i wonder whether these surveys and i'm not being critical is the cause du jour you know what's on everybody's mind uh, you know today where this has to be looked at long term, because by the time this is delivered, it's five, ten years from now. To uh, Commissioner Gattel's and and Commissioner McGuire's comments about the suburbs. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Dugan. Mr. Chair. Yes, Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to put a pitch out there again for the service allocation workshop on the third. Um, uh, if you recall that process, we landed on two primary scenarios where one was to expand the range of communities where it's possible to live without a car. And then the second one was to strengthen connections to suburban jobs and opportunities. Um, so I think that, um, you know, how you really start to inform long range plans, even things like a transportation policy plan, you know, you've heard me say it over and over is it's it, how we, we plan in the long run is how, what we study um, in the meantime. And so it's, it's influencing through some of those things. So I'd really encourage as many of you to attend on the third as possibly can to continue this discussion. Thank you, member Barber. Any other questions, comments with regard to the update mayor mary thank you mr chair and, and congratulations to everyone uh in the election cycle and uh, get, uh to mr to uh commissioner Malichnik. uh what member dugan said was uh, quite true and i applaud him for saying that uh, i wanted to just consider our east west connections that we have in our suburban areas and in one particular, well, two areas, Trunk Highway uh, or uh, CASA 42, as well as um, 13. And that could have a really important significance for our whole region. So as we think about uh, our future, uh, looking at those uh, east-west connections in our suburban communities will be important. Uh, and there will be important linkages for what we are delivering for the whole region. Thanks. 
Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Well, that's uh, thanks for that update, uh, Ms. Kaufman and Ms. Roth. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month, and then uh, then again in April as we make some decisions here, or some recommendations, I should say. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, continue. Yes, I, I think uh, Member Geisler had his hand up, and then I, I would like to have a comment as well. I see him raising sure. his hand. All right, thank you, Member Geisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Coven, you know, the one thing I would say as a, as a citizen member um, coming to the cities and talking about comp plans and all that, I think it would be very helpful to have some kind of distilled, you know, one, two pager thing that we as, a, as citizens or as people who are engaged on planning commissions, park boards, things like that, um, that are at least talk to our county or our, our city councils more often to say, like, you know, I'm looking at the, the line 10 coming up, which is getting towards my city which isn't even on this map um just you know for, to speak to the suburban need question here but to be able to say hey when this abrt line comes up here here's what it will do to the transit lines next to it because it creates kind of you know it creates a new a new backbone for other local lines to feed off of and you know while all that's going up in fridley and kind of ends in blaine well, Coon Rapids can benefit from that. And, you know, and what happens to Blaine around there and the north side of Blaine. And, and so understanding that, you know, th these long range things are honestly, I mean, we're making plans beyond an election cycle for a lot of folks here. Um, so they are really, where do we want to go? Where do we want to see it? I know we're doing comp plans, but, but being able to distill it down to a simple way to say, look, if we get an EBRT line up here, it means that there will be good constant service here. And then these secondary lines will get more usage, which will help drive more more usage in transit, which will help bump these numbers up, which will help engagement. You know, it, it's it's the snowball effect, right? And so I think anything in, in the communication package like that for just you know those of us who are who are not elected but are still deeply engaged, that we can pass out on a, on a very simple basis. And you know, the Network Next website and all those things are really great, but but having that you know that one slide to say. Hey, city manager, could could you just throw this on the workshop so that I can talk about it for five minutes? That'd be awesome. Thanks. Um, just just to, as another another venue to that you can explore. Good. Thank you, Member Geisler and Mayor Winshuttle. Yeah, I, I just you know as we're talking about kind of the, the metro wide, I, I want to forget about don't want to forget about communities like ourselves that have the opt out service. And that's so important. We got to make sure that they continue their funding and that they don't get lost in this uh, giant shuffle as we move forward uh, because for us our bus service is i mean uh, that that is everything to our community and if that loses its funding and can't provide that service i i'm, I'm not sure what will happen so i i just want to make that comment that we look out for all parts of transportation even though ours is very limited but ours is uh considered the opt-out and that's kind of sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. So I just want to make that comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. All right, folks, good discussion. Um, now the next item we have, it's on the informational portion of the agenda, but it feels a lot more like business in the heart of our business. And that is uh, uh, every uh, couple of years discussing how to uh, allocate almost $200 million uh, that comes in from the federal government to the region. And we've we've got some work left to do before we make a decision next month. Uh, we've narrowed down the scenarios. Remember, we went to the Molutionic model, we call it now, the last meeting. And we've got four scenarios now. We've got to make a recommendation, I think, today on, on that, try to cut those down a little bit more, narrow that down so we have a more compressed discussion in December. And then we've got to make a recommendation, I think, for folks uh, for the uh, on the over programming issue. How should we allocate those over programming monies? And we've gotten some recommendations from our technical folks on that that I'm sure everybody has absorbed and thought about. And then we've got that uh, kind of late to the party uh, money, uh, the four and a half million dollars that's coming back in uh, from Metro Transit. Uh, that's being returned, how should that be allocated? Should we deal with that in this solicitation or uh, park it and use it in the next solicitation? So I think Commissioner uh, Karwaski, before we started, 
the conversation, uh, and we have Steve and Joe, uh, Steve Peterson and Joe Barbeau uh, lead us through that conversation or the setup for the conversation. You had a comment you wanted to make. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, this item was only added 24 hours ago. Uh, I think it's best to table it. I'd like to just give a little bit of background and then rationale for tabling it. Uh, the 4.5 million return was part of the goal line project, a park and ride. And during the development of the project, it ended up, the route ended up switching into Woodbury uh, from Lake Elmo. So it's a, we still need the money for the park and ride and we, we wanna make the case for that. The park and ride route is on 494 in Woodbury. It was awarded $7 million uh, because it rates so highly, but also uh, through uh, modernization, I believe transit, uh, downtown stations were also awarded $7 million. Washington and Ramsey County decided it was best to support, take our one-time funding. You can only pick one, it's a newer rule to support the downtown station. So there is no funding for the Woodbury Park and Ride. Uh, we feel there's an ultimate case to be made that the spirit of that money was to provide a park and ride money for the goal line and we just would like to shift it. But rather we have a robust schedule today and rather than add this, we feel this money was appropriated in 2013, 2014 and it shouldn't be part of the 2020 regional solicitation. So I'm asking eventual support of the concept of keeping the money in Washington County for the same project. But for today, I'm asking support to uh, uh, table this discussion and uh, consider these future funds be appropriated outside uh, outside the scenario of the 2020 uh okay hold that okay. commissioner thank you but you hold that thought i think we should walk through the different scenarios first and to me that might be the last thing we want to discuss here in, in terms of potential uh allocation or parking as you say it or deference uh, yeah if we want to get down we want to get those scenarios down first and then we want to decide what to do with the over-programming. And then maybe in the context of over-programming, we can, we can segue into this conversation about this uh, four and a half million that's coming back. And I think your comments are well taken, but if you hold that, we're going to give you a chance to argue that one more time. Thank you. And hopefully I won't have to argue it, but uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. All right. So uh, for um, Steve Peterson and Joe Barbeau, do you want to, um, Start to share content and hi, Mr. Chair. This is Joe, and Steve is uh, scheduled to do the presentation, but he's informed me that something's going awry with his computer. So I'll start, and he'll probably jump in at some point. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. Let's see. So <clears throat> we know why we're here. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is the last day that we'll see, see this as an info item and we're looking for approval on the 16th of December. So uh, tomorrow is the first, um, the first item of recommendation from the Funding and Program Committee. They're gonna see an action item very similar to the information item you're seeing today. Um, and we'll also be uh, providing them any additional feedback that you provide today. Um, so, Today's meeting, uh, we have the four options that came in part from your discussion a month ago, along with uh, funding, I'm sorry, TAC discussion a couple of weeks ago on how to allocate um, uh, over programming, $20 million roughly of over programming. Um, we're going to review the technical committee's feedback, including um, their preference to not skip over high scoring projects. Uh, they were very adamant about that. They thought that uh, the idea of skipping projects to uh, uh, higher scoring projects to lower scoring projects um, sort of cut into the value and the credibility of the scoring process, if you will. And then to narrow down um, the remaining options um, to send to the technical committees um, as they take action, and as I said, starting tomorrow. So you've seen this before. 
Um, I won't get too into it, but this is our three modal categories, roadways, transit, bike pad, and then the five, four, and three respective category, um, funding categories that we have for them. And you'll see uh, the projects assigned to each in a minute. So, of course, last time there was a lot of discussion about demographics. Um, uh, and while there is no uh, optimal way necessarily to determine geographic balance, uh, we have been sort of relying on population and jobs versus funds spent, federal funds spent. So you can see the populations and jobs here of our seven counties. <clears throat> and um, our two scenarios, uh, historical process, that was uh, the one that was sort of favored for much of the time last month, and the more project scenario, um, each of which has three or one options for spending over programming. So what you see here is uh, how this would break out with no over programming. Um, as you know, the Scott County was the only county that didn't get any, have any projects located within it. Um, and you see the other counties here and how they break down. So then uh, this next table also is a no over programming table, but it, uh, it shows the history um, that has occurred since 20, 2014, which many of you remember was the big overhaul to this, uh, to roughly this regional solicitation process and format. So um, uh, the discussion often last month ended with TAC uh, lead, lends towards that, uh, that perhaps um, modal balance, I'm sorry, uh, geographic balance is more of a long term than a solicitation by solicitation action. So this shows you know, for example, Scott County, even after not getting any funds with the no over programming scenario, would uh, be at about 5% uh, since 2014, which is, oops, which is about on par with their uh, population. Um, and so this shows where we're at for all of the counties for the, what would be the four cycles. Again, not counting over programming because we'd have to show just too many columns if we did. <clears throat> so, hey, hey Joe, I'm, I'm back here. I could uh, take over if you want me to. Sure, so go for it. Sounds like you're doing great, though. I should just let you keep going. Yeah, well, too late. <laughs> um, and so, thanks, thanks, Joe. So, what uh, what we have here, we we brought we're bringing back to tab um, four options uh, for what to do with that over programming. Um, three of those options relate back to the orange scenario, which was the historical process. And uh, one of those scenarios relates to what was the pink, the more projects. Um, again, that focused on the smaller project categories within each mode. And um, so we'll go through what those are. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so inspired by uh, council member Reich here last month, he said, you know, maybe we, if we can, if we can compare things um, at a fair, in a fair manner, um, maybe can help us get to a decision. So we put together a decision tree that we'd like to use this month. And again, the hope uh, is that we can get down to one scenario by the end of today here, if at all possible. And so the key question I think that we want to ask the tab to, to lead us to that decision is, um, number one, should over-programming ensure that each county gets a project within its borders? Um, each cycle. Um, if the answer that you have to that question today is yes, uh, then the two scenarios on the left, um, what we're showing as 1A, an iteration of the historic process, or 1B, are two ways to get there without skipping over any projects. And Joe probably went over that, um, that TAC feedback of um, strong preference not to skip over higher scoring projects. If the answer is to no to that first base question, of do you believe that every county should get a project uh, within its borders each cycle? Then we have two, two other options on the far right side. Um, both of them are pretty close to the modal midpoints, but one of them does fund lower cost projects and another one, and we're saying extends the modal midpoint. Uh, one of those is when with the orange scenario, one is with a pink. So next slide, This we'll go through what the details of each of these are here too. So again, we have the, the three over programming options for the orange scenario or the historic process. Uh, we put together a, a chart here of the pros and cons of that. Again, the first, the first two, 1A and 1B, um, hit, hit a, a Scott County project. Uh, one of them does that by fully funding pro, uh, two projects to get there. Um, one of those is a um, equity project uh, in strategic capacity 
uh, from Carver County, and then and then the next one is uh, Scott County. One uh, B would have that same approach, but it would only partially fund those projects. So we dip back um, to what was the old maximum award in um, in strategic capacity. It used to be seven million, and we upped it to ten million. So if we drop back to that seven million and fund those same two projects, one being Carver County, one Scott County. Um, that leaves us more money to go to, and we put the rest of the money into bike ped, various bike ped projects. And we'll go through the details again in a, in a few minutes. Um, one C is uh, relates again to the historical process uh, scenario, the orange. Um, but we heard that tab and then also at a lot of the com um, technical committees was an interest in funding more of those low cost projects, both in uh, roadways and in um, in the bike pad area. So that's that's where it does. It does not fund another transit project, uh, 1C does, but it does fund other lower cost roadway and primarily bike pad projects. And then uh, 2A, which is the, the pink last row, um, you know, you lose you lose a few things there and you gain gain a few. One, one thing you lose relative to the orange is um, a big project for Washington County. Uh, what you gain is uh, through that is we're following the modal midpoints uh, to a T and you're going to get, get another transit project, uh, that being a Southwest transit, uh, Southwest prime expansion project. Uh, so those are the four over programming options we have. And if you go to the next slide here, please, Joe. Um, here's, here's again, another table that would, that would show the distribution by County uh, for this cycle. Um, again, we have 1A, 1B, 1C, those are the columns to look at, as well as 2A on the far right side. Okay, next slide, please. And then, um, did you want to go through the uh, those other slide, uh, slides, Joe, we had on the, um, the extra Metro Transit money? I guess I can just verbalize that. Um, so what Chair Hovland opened up the meeting with was uh, a few days ago, we did, we did receive uh, about $4.5 million uh, that was a return back to the region from that Metro Transit project that was on I-94 and uh, Manning um, out in Washington County. And so with that money, uh, we, you know, there's a few options. Our probably preference would be uh, for that money is, is to close up the solicitation and and in the next few months, um, look, do a deeper dive on what to use for that 4.5 million. So um, after thinking about it a little bit more, we, you know, we probably don't have to wait until the next full solicitation two years from now. It's probably more of a, a of winter 2021 activity in the next few months that we could go back to it. But um, there is that option if, if you think that uh, including that 4.5 million now uh, as part of this December approval can help uh, get to a decision uh, we could put that in there. Um, we could add that money to it. Um, our recommendation, um, because it was coming from transit money in the last two big projects to fall out have been transit, would be to put it back uh, towards a transit project. And and uh, we've given some options on the next slide on how potentially you could do it. But I think the bigger Steve, question is... Steve, Stan Karwaski. Could yes, sir. Thompson just weigh in a little bit on this? He could provide some... I think good background, if you don't mind. Sure. Yep. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Nick. Yep. Yeah, this one is a unique one because of, the Commissioner had mentioned, there's a long history of this project with the money being assigned to the gold line. And then, you know, kind of finally reaching an end, end point this, you know, in the last week where just couldn't move that project forward. It had fully been designed, but it just was no longer the end of the gold line. We could not reach an agreement with the developers why the money is coming back. And it is very late in the game for this to be part of the TAP decision is why I think from a staff level, we concur that it'd be good to close up this regional solicitation without making a decision on that goal. And, we, and let us spend some time coming through some options um, outside of this is what were this tab rec, part of staff recommendation came, which I think Commissioner you, you had mentioned also. And then um, 
we'll be able to look at, bring back a little, a little more detail about the policy and then the different options uh, that we can fully think through on, on where this 4.5 million could go for the right, make sure the right project for the region. I think it'll help, I think you'll be able to make a, a good decision today without this $4.5 million kind of clouding the decision among the three, four options we're presenting for over programming today. If that, if that helps. All right, thanks, Nick. You cut out from time to time there, but I think your <clears throat> your general notion was that we, we hold off on doing anything with respect to this money and get some further staff input on uh, potential options after this solicitation is closed out. Is that what correct. That's correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Steve, let's go back to you and finish up your presentation portion yeah. of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a few things, if we could switch over to the info item here, Joe. I want to point out three things uh, here to the group and then uh, obviously open it to discussion. Um, uh, number one, we had a request um, to look at uh, or to document the rules of the solicitation. So that's shown as figure one um, in the packet that you have. So thanks uh, to, Council or to um, Member Dugan for that uh, recommendation. So we have a one pager on all, all the various rules of the solicitation and, and, um, and how we're following them um, to a T here. Uh, number two, we did put together some maps. There's you know, a lot of ways to look at geographic balance. Uh, two years ago when we brought um, this issue back to the tab. Another one, way we looked at it was by quadrant um, of the metro area. So uh, we split split the uh, metro area into four. And um, essentially what, the, what it showed was, um, if we kind of zero in on that southwest uh, area again here, that's in question, um, over time that it, that area has uh, been getting its, its, I would say, relative to its population, actually more funding than its population. And, and this is, you know, Carver, Scott, part of Hennepin and part of Dakota. Uh, but if you look at it from a little wi wider than a county perspective, um, um, there's not a, a, a real uh, disadvantage that we're seeing over time, especially, or in the cycle for that matter, um, with Carver County getting probably a lot this, this cycle. Um, so that's, that's uh, in tabular format here too. And then lastly, uh, just to go through the tables, just just quickly so you can kind of see what projects um, we're comparing among the four over programming options. Um, so again, this first page is the roadways. Um, the first uh, three, if people can see that close enough or zoom in on their own screen. And the things that jump out uh, to me on this, on this page, uh, you've got the, the four different columns. So you've got the three different historical process uh, over programming options and the one pink one, which is the more projects. Um, if you want to fund more of those smaller projects, the uh, the two right columns are hitting more of those kind of ITS and spot mobility intersection projects, and you can see more of the gray. The gray is the over programming projects are being hit. Um, where we're hitting, where we're going to get a Scott County project is one of the first two options. If you could scroll down just slightly here, Joe, and maybe zoom in as if you could. Um, this is the approach that TAC is sending you. Um, if you, if that's uh, the preference of TAB is to make sure that Scott County gets a project. Uh, here's the best way that we found to, to do that without skipping projects. We uh, fund the Tarver County project and the Scott County project either in full, um, or if you want to kind of partially fund that at $7 million a project and put, in this case, we put the rest of it in bike ped projects, uh, that would be option to 1B um would be another way to get there so if you could slightly scroll down joe to the next so, page please so, so steve if if uh this is uh member windshuttle if i could jump in mr chair just yes mayor um uh, so like we, we call 1a uh, you know uh the column that everyone gets a program and sometimes i don't know if that's the right way to label it maybe we should just say that it's 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 larger projects that benefit the regional area Mm -hmm. So maybe that that kind of changes how you, you hear it because I know there was some pushback about uh, some people thought it was a good idea that everybody gets something. Some say, well, the projects didn't meet the criteria, and that's the way staff feels. So maybe we just say that it's a larger projects that regional benefits. And I think the other thing that we might might want to mention is uh, 
when we first looked at this last month, Scott County's project was quite a bit lower, but I, I think that their score was reevaluated and, and now got moved to this level. So it's really now it's not quite that where we're skipping over others to do things because now they're they're right in line with the Carver County project. So I think that that's changed uh, uh, quite a bit from our last meeting. Okay, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's some good some good comments there. Um, maybe just uh, one thing to point out: we did uh, did not change the score on any of the projects. Uh, we did have a, a funding scenario that that you saw last month that did go all the way down to Scott County um, that did not include over programming, and um, that was one of them that the tab uh, voted to dismiss. And so, in this case, we're using the twenty million of over over programming. Um, to get there, um, and so that, that's maybe one one change on how we use that twenty million of over programming. Um, one, of, we wanted to at least bring you an option where we would get uh, Scott County a project, and so uh, two yeah. options that were brought forward, but but uh, didn't change the score anywhere. But yeah, it is it is slightly you know the funny scenarios that we brought to you were were different last month overall. Yep. Um, all right, so let's go back to uh, Member Barnes. He's got a comment with respect to MnDOT. You remember he made a presentation last uh, month about the, the limitations that MnDOT was going to have, at least they perceived they might have with respect to the larger projects. So it could be influential, influential in the conversation here. Member Barnes? On projects have been dealt with. She, she, she said ask. How Who's got that? Somebody should put their microphone on mute if they're having a sidebar. All right, Mr. Chair, uh, thanks here. I, you had asked on the last meeting when we had the discussion, you know, when I brought up about, you know, the number of projects and just kind of where we were at with uh, the, the funding due to the regular program, bond funds, uh, grants, those things. So what uh, we did, we had um, our staff, our planning staff look at the overall program and at this point based on what we, what we know and again things will will change and evolve but uh, i think you and, and others were kind of looking for at least a number rather than just verbal so what we looked at is um, from a planning perspective when you look at the list that we would look to fund um, out of the mobility funds that 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 we have we'd look at 10 million dollars per year or 20 million um from for so it'd be 10 million for 24 10 for 20 year 25 so a 20 million total from from MnDOT that we feel like we can you know be able to put forward and again things will, will change but we um, you know again based on the elections and who knows what the the funding is going to be so hopefully as we go with this I know there were others that had mentioned that you know that they would kind of go at it without you know anything from from us well we knew that zero isn't you know we 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 don't wouldn't want to do that but from there then. You know, since that amount, when you look at the list, isn't going to be significant. You know, our our approach would be is to have it where, based on the priorities here, of putting it towards the um, the, the tabs priority project. Well, you know, I don't know if I can say plural projects, but so you can see from there that as it's going, that you know, you, people would know that we just don't we just don't have enough to to, to help with all again, unless things funding scenarios change so hopefully that helps mr chair so mr. Mr. Chair? does that uh, does that lead you to uh have a position uh, as uh, mindot with respect to the historical process in orange or the more project scenario in pink so from there when you look at them it's it all comes down to is you know, the, the group there's gonna be other things that that decide it uh, i think at the end that's from the funding standpoint i don't know from from ours, I mean, our preference would be is to not have more projects given what we have now, but but who knows again, based on the, the the scenarios, excuse me, funding scenarios out there for potential grants or federal stimulus, who knows? But at this point, whichever one is chose, um, we just don't have much to really participate in. So, all right, okay, less that's, is better. So, yeah, that's your cautionary note is that regardless of which route the tab makes a recommendation on. You've got limitations at MnDOT. Right, at this point, yep. Okay, all right. And then somebody had uh, inquired of the chair, was it Mayor Winchettle again? 
Oh, okay. Not me, not me, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Chair, Steve, I was inquiring. Or... Oh, okay, uh, Commissioner Ulrich, thank you. Well, I got a uh, comment right away on uh, uh, Mr. Barnes's comment on uh, additional money. We've, we've told MnDOT Metro that we wouldn't be asking them for help with our project it is a uh, ex very expensive project. It's a highway through Scott County at 169 and um, 212. It's a it's a 30 million dollar project. We um, would be having to find 20 million uh, to bring to the project, which we've done that kind of thing before with our transportation sales tax. That's why we enacted it, and that that with the uh, the wheelage tax as well. And so we're prepared to to do that project would which would greatly benefit the entire region. And you know, us getting 10 million just gives us the privilege of coming up with 20 more, uh, it, which is a big lift for a small county, you know? And so, but we're, we're ready to do that. We, we did the same thing uh, at 169 and 41. We did get a tiger grant there and we got regional solicitation there, but we came up with $27 million from our, our uh, local sales tax for that project. So, so Scott County has been weighing in with their own dollars to make these projects go. So when we get our regional solicitation, we're leveraging dollars from all over the place and heavily using our transportation sales tax. And, and we're happy to do that. You know, we've been a, a regional player. I've been on the tab for 20 years and, and we've been pulling for each other's projects all these years. I don't know that we've ever said no to this yes and no question that's before us today. I can't recall a county not getting a project in 20 years. I could be wrong. It's possible, um, but I don't. I don't recall us ever saying no to, to a county getting a project. And and you know, my thought. This is a just a stray thought. It, it this Scott County getting a project, not getting a project. It's kind of an artificial way to think of it. This is a project in Scott County, but it's really a regional. It's a MnDOT project. It's a highway. You know, so. When we loaned $15 million to the Crosstown project for that $250 million project, did we count that as Hennepin County's project? No, we didn't. But, but we as a region pulled together to do that kind of thing. And, and that's what we've been doing all these years. And so I would just say, um, I hope you will say yes to the idea that every county should get a project. And that's a principle we've lived with all these years. And I think we ought to continue with that. That's what I have to say for right now. And Commissioner, while you're while you're taking that position with respect to what would be your comment with respect to one A or one B, which one A is uh, every county gets a project, and then one B is each county gets a project, but it's partial funding. Any thoughts on well, that? Or? We're sort of on a knife's edge on that because it's such a lift to come up with a twenty to have it come up with twenty three. I can tell you, if it was five, we would have said no. We we can't. We're not going to accept the five. We, we will. Followed and we couldn't have accepted five, but we're sort of on the knife's edge there with having to come up with the additional, uh, which would be $23 million for a $30 million project. So, um, so, so, but if you pushed me, I would say, um, we, 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 we would, we would uh, have to take the 7 million. I, but, but it, it is a, a very close call for us because we're not sure how we'll come up with all that money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like you're leaning towards the historical process, uh, the orange scenario, but that has the uh, 46 funded projects, but it's uh, it's the 1A. Correct. Option. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Other, other uh, oh, uh, Steve Peterson, you want to go back to your presentation and finish up your thoughts for us so it can help with the conversation? Oh, sure, 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 and we'll try and make this brief if Joe could go to the next page here. Um, we're just trying to highlight what the differences are between the over programming options for you from these different lists. And so this is still roadway. This is roadway reconstruction. Um, the one difference here you can see in the pink, uh, we are over programming and getting a, a larger project in Dakota County. Um, so that is uh, unique to uh, 2A in this case. Uh, okay, moving down, Joe. Um, again, this is the Here's the transit uh, expansion and transit modernization pages. And uh, 2A is the only one that would fund a, uh, another transit project and follows the modal midpoints. 1C 
is pretty close to following the modal midpoints, but uh, 2A is really the only one that, that uh, follows it really closely. Uh, 1B and 1C are close, but 2A is the only one that does that and gets another transit project. So next slide, please, or next page. Um, and then here's the multi-use trail bicycle facilities. And there's a, a, a little bit of difference between this, the scenarios. Uh, two of them get all the way down to a um, Minnetonka Hopkins Crossroads Trail. Uh, then right in the mix there is you've got a, um, one scenario gets down to a uh, city of Coon Rapids, number nine. Another one gets down to a city of Chaska Trail. So there's a, uh, some differences in the multi-use trails. Then scrolling down. Uh, so here's pedestrian facilities and safe routes to school. And in in three of the four cases, you're funding almost every single project uh, in there. And that's something that we heard from, from TAB and technical committees too about trying to fund more of those low cost projects. Um, the 1A is is the difference where it still actually funds, you know, half or more of those projects, but uh, because you're you're putting the 10 million and 9 million on the on the roadways, it only leaves you with one additional project here, but um, obviously that's up to TAB to decide where which direction they want to go. So those are the key differences between the scenarios and just wanted to point out where where the technical committees um, are bringing you different over programming options. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I think, you know, the, the two key questions are, uh, do we want to um, wait, hold on that $4.5 million of transit, uh, which um, again, we're recommending we, we wait on that a little bit. And then two is, trying to narrow down these four uh, remaining options to uh, one or two um, if we can here today. So thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, all right, thank you. Um, folks, before we go further here on discussion, it's already 2.20, we'll typically we'd be done at 2.30. Uh, other folks like me probably have another Zoom call at three. So I'm thinking that within the next half hour, we should try to address these three issues that we have to address. One is with respect to the one uh, issue that Steve just raised, and that is uh, make a recommendation on how the 4.5 million returned uh, should be allocated or parked for now. Uh, staff recommendation is that we set it aside for now and they'll come back with recommendations uh, post solicitation. And then we, may, we need to make a recommendation on our preference on uh, how to use those over programming dollars that we've committed ourselves to using in some form or fashion you want to follow the historic midpoint like Steve was just talking about on 2A, uh, you get those modal midpoints for dissemination of that extra 20 million, or do you want to use uh, do a method, treat it like bonus money and use it in a, in a more uh, geographically balanced way like 1A represents uh, the, the primary purpose there would be to fund a project in each county, for example, then you've got two variations on, on that with 1B and 1C. Uh, and uh, then the other question was narrow down the scenarios. The one, if we can, uh, for purposes of uh, both our technical advisory folks and then our staff, so we can have a we can have a good discussion next month to make a decision. All right. So let's take, maybe this is the low hanging fruit first. Uh, is there anyone who objects to uh, setting aside the four point five million return from Metro Transit? and let staff make a recommendation on how to use those funds after they analyze this issue more carefully uh, uh, post Chair, making a decision in December. Mr. Chair, I, I have a question with regard to that question. Yes, yeah, would you maybe pull down the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation now so we can see all the members? And I think it's Mayor Mary that raised that yeah, issue. It was, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, I want to know um, how funding for other uh, withdrawn projects have been dealt with in the past so that we can be consistent. So if Mr. Chair, if, if staff could let us know that. Uh, sure, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, member Heyman Rowland. The, uh, what, we, what we've done in the past with uh, projects that have been withdrawn in in general, it hasn't been, you know, this is this money was from a long time ago, in fact, and and usually we get the money returned last minute, and then it goes into we have, you know, via our policy, uh, first we would we pay down over programming, and that's usually what we've done is, especially the last few cycles where we've over programmed quite a bit, um, projects that return to the region are first 
pay down that over programming and then uh, from there you're you're staying within the mode and trying to shift up projects to earlier years and you know there's a whole whole sequencing of things but uh, when we have future year money uh, which we're treat we're saying this is probably future year money it does open up some other options um, per the policy so 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 I understand thank you mr. chair for allowing me to have a sure. uh, clarifying question so we've always incorporated that money into the regional solicitation for over programming Um, Mr. In the past. Chair, in, the past. Uh, in, in the past, we have primarily paid down the over-programming it uh, when the money was in the same year. Um, you know, we never, we don't want to give the money back. And so we have the process um, that we go through. But, but in this case, we're, in this case, there isn't those, those restrictions on the time frame and having to use the money this year. And so that's why I'm suggesting that the policy says the first the first priority for uh, future year funds is to put it into a future solicitation. Uh, or could Mr. Chair, could I follow up with that? Yes, could, we go ahead, Mayor. It, could we make that decision in December? Could we make that decision when we when we see all the scenarios, when we we see the recommendation? Could that decision be made in December then? But I think, uh, Mayor, don't you think people, uh, if we defer till December, then they've got to, at a staff level, figure out where are the possibilities, what what are the possibilities for use of those money? So they have to build out some different scenarios that would include the 4.5 million. So it's not as simple as just holding off on that decision until until uh, December. I'm gonna go to Commissioner Malushnik in a, in a second here, but. Um, uh, Nick Thompson, do you want to articulate uh, why you think uh, this money that we, you know, we just got notification that it's coming back a couple of days ago might be treated a little bit differently than what we've historically done with this money in, in terms of just pushing it into the over-programmed account? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I think it's in, in part because uh, we, we made a commitment to TAB that we would get the regional solicitation done in December this year. Um, and this this is really complicating the different scenarios. And um, and so we're a little worried about um, not meeting the December time frame because really today, hopefully we'll get down to one. Um, but then also because it's this old money, there's more options than, than typical uh, than if it was 2023 money coming back that would just go to an older programming. And so we haven't, I think there's just more options that we need to present to you and pros and cons than, than what we have had in the past where we bring in money. And we're just, from the staff, we thought it would overcomplicate it when really the important part is to decide the couple hundred million dollars here. And you will get the program this 4.5 million. That's the good news. We're not gonna lose this money. Um, we just thought it would be maybe a discrete decision separate from the overall program might be easier to make a decision on the scenario. And we could we can come back, I think, as soon as January, probably, uh, separate from the, the original solicitation process will be done. We can come back and say, well, we can look at the projects that weren't funded as part of that discussion you know, of how to, where to allocate it, if that helps. Mayor, I, I, Mr. Chair, thank you for uh, thank you for that, uh, Nick. I I I'd like to see us get that 4.5 uh, million into a project so that we can get moving with it. And so I guess I'm I'm looking at what past practices have been. I appreciate. I don't want to slow this process down. I think we can get to uh, a one scenario uh, today, but. Uh, I appreciate your consideration on that, and I don't know what other members think. All right, well, we're gonna find out here. Remember, uh, Commissioner Malushnik and then Commissioner Gattel. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I just think we all need a little bit more information and staff to work on this. So uh, I don't know if a motion is appropriate, but I move that uh, 
we go with staff recommendation on the four point five million dollars in question. I'll second. All right. Who is the seconder? Gotel. Gotel. Thank you. And may I uh, comment? May I comment? Yes. Yeah. Sure. I, I too agree that we need a little bit more time, and I think putting this on hold. I don't think it is going to slow anything if we have something in January that's only a couple of months away, folks. I know it's going fast; the year is going fast. So I, I'm in favor of staff's recommendation. All right. Um, anybody else wish to speak on this issue as part of the discussion on the motion? All right. We got a motion, then a second to. Um, um, Basically, defer decision on use of the 4.5 million return from Metro Transit until uh, uh, after this uh, solicitation work is finished in December. All right, roll call, please, with respect to the motion as stated. Anderson. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Harbor. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Boyles. Aye. Crimmins. Aye. Jagan. Aye. Foster. Aye. Martinson. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Giuliani Stevens. Aye. Hotel. Aye. Cayman Olin. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Holberg. Holland's head. Holland's head. Karwaski. Aye. Lindicky. Aye. Look. Aye. Malichnik. Aye. Bewen. Aye. McGuire. Aye. Narayanan. Aye. Petrick. Reich. Reich. Sanger. Aye. Schember. Aye. Stephenson. Aye. Swanson. Tolbert. Yes. Ulrich. Aye. Windshuttle. Aye. Washi. Washi. All right. Motion carries. Uh, we will um, we will deal with the four point five million return from Metro Transit uh, after the first of the year and after the solicitation work is completed. Uh, next, um, Steve or Joe uh, or Nick. Uh, we've now got uh, we've got um, the Malushnik model with four variations on theme. Uh, we need to narrow down the scenarios, and uh, embedded in that is a recommendation, really, of how uh, are you seeking a recommendation of how we deal with those overprogrammed funds because that drives that drives everything. So uh, you went through those uh, those four scenarios: one uh, A, one B, one C, and then two A. Um, and I'm wondering what uh, folks' thoughts are on that particular matter, and we'll go to Commissioner Gattel first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. appreciate that. Um, first of all, I just want to say that the staff did a lot of heavy duty and heavy lifting to maybe look at this, and I had studied this quite a bit before uh, the meeting. And so I'm in favor of 1B, but 1A would work as well. And the reason is, is that I really believe Scott County deserves a, a project there. And I think in this time of the economy, uh, making sure that everybody has jobs and shares the economic wealth of those jobs throughout every county is probably paramount. I prefer 1B only because I really like a multimodal um, approach and we get more projects in that way. And I think that really matters that we're not just doing roads or bridges, that we're doing multimodal. And so that would be my preference. And those are my thoughts around just making sure that everybody gets a project. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Malushnik and then uh, Member Geisler. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm comfortable with either 1A or 1B at this time. All right, and uh, Member Geisler and then Member Lindeke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will differ my opinion slightly there. I'm glad we're sticking with the TAC recommendation to follow the scores. Um, I think that's important. I just wanted to put that in there. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, I'm good with 1B or 1C um, from the perspective of what the only reason why I'm really not leaning into 1A is that sends 10 million to Carver, 10 million to Scott, and it's kind of putting all our eggs in the one basket. And we're ju we just discussed project turn back. And I think spreading, spreading it around is better, um, especially with the discussions about how, how much lift we're going to have to do in Scott County to, to do the local match. Um, I think we need to talk about the risk of project turn back and why we're doing over programming in the first place. Um, so over programming into a risky project seems kind of uh, like a challenging piece to me. The main reason why I support one C the most, uh, it spreads the money around the most spot mobility, which is our new item uh, gets new investment. And we're showing that we're investing in this new category, which is still roadways, but they're local. They're smaller projects. There's less local match. Um, we're funding all the SRS stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think all in all, 1C is the better solution. I can live with 1B, in my opinion. So thank you. All right, Member Lindeke. And then I want to go back to Commissioner Ulrich after that for just further comment on, on these different scenarios that are popping up. And then uh, Commissioner Karawaski as well. Member Lindeke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to put in a plug for 1B. I think it's um, the big difference that I see is the way that all the pedestrian safety um, projects are funded in that scenario. And I think that's really important right now. Um, we need to focus on pedestrian safety. There's a, there's a crisis in America and in Minnesota around uh, distracted driving and increasing size of vehicles um, that combines with the increasing use of uh, sidewalks and um, crosswalks by people as they're walking around during this pandemic. I think it's um, a big problem public health wise. And um, this is the kind of a case where a small amount of money can make a big difference and fund, uh, you know, five, six, seven projects, um, you know, right away. We don't have to wait years for these uh, needed safety improvements. So I, that's the one that I think is the best out of these choices. Thank you, Member Lindeke. And then back to uh, Commissioner Ulrich, and then um, Commissioner Karwaski, and then Commissioner McGuire. Uh, I didn't have any additional uh, comments. And you have questions. But there was a statement I, I guess I can comment on is that we came up with $27 million on the uh, 16941 project. We won't be turning money back. It's, it won't be a risk to give us um, the money uh, so for this project. So my question for you, I guess, Commissioner Ulrich, that wasn't very well articulated, was as as you hear people talking about 1A or 1B or 1C, is your, you, have, you have a preference as between them. I think you mentioned 1A. Well, yes, yeah, so 1A is, what 1C doesn't give us any uh, projects. So um, we could, we'd prefer 1A, we would, we would live with 1B. All right, thank you. Commissioner Karwaski and then Commissioner McGuire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 1C is the best for Washington County, but I do agree with what Commissioner Ulrich and other commissioners have said that, you know, we're in this together. I find it hard to believe not to get money to a county for a project. Uh, 1C is uh, we would give up uh, quite a bit for Washington County. Uh, I think 1B is kind of a, we're, we're giving uh, money up for the, better cause of the region. So I, I would favor uh, 1B. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question for Nick or whoever, because, you know, we all want equity in the region and I don't want to see any county go without, but I have been asking this question a lot, you know, well, how, how do we decide? And they said, well, over time, every county, if you don't get something this time, you'll get something next time. So they've done these scenarios where every county and, you know, over the over time gets it. Maybe you don't get a project every cycle, but you get it, you know, throughout all the cycles. So I, I want to see Jonathan, I want to see you get a project, but I think some, you know, I think what I would like to see is for the benefit of the region, maybe we fund some things in other counties that now and then Scott will get more next time or something. So Jonathan, can you just talk to me a little bit about 
um, how that equity, and I see Randy's got his hand up too, and um, you know how that how that averages out. Well, in 20 years, uh, I don't think we've used the overtime argument. Uh, <laughs> we've used the it did every county get a project in the solicitation. We never we never ruled out a county based on overtime. Um, so that would be a new way of thinking. And uh, at least in my recollection of the last 20 years. Commissioner Repair, is that does that help you at all? Yeah, I, I was just I, I was just um I think one, if you if you decide one, you want to go to some hybrid of one B, one uh, one A, B, or C or two A, it's gonna really create complications. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be me. No, I'm joking. I don't. I don't want to see Scott County not get anything. I was just curious about, you know, about the overtime kind of debate. And I guess Jonathan, I've I've heard that overtime it averages out, but maybe that still leads at least one project in each county. I I I was just wanting some clarification on that. Take a look at uh, take a look at uh, page um, if you got oh it's page three I think, but I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go. Let's see who hasn't. Uh, oh, there was somebody I was going to go to. Though. Oh, yeah. Member Dugan was next. Then I'm going to go to Commissioner Holbert, and then back to Commissioner Malushnik. If it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to comment on Dakota County. So may I defer it until after Commissioner Holbert speaks? You can. Yeah, Commissioner Mary Liz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Um... I, you know, I agree that Scott County should get their project funded. It's um, it's not related to commuter congestion. It's an expansion project, but on a Saturday morning, that that intersection is a total mess. So um, I think it's a very important project. But when you, I mean, I'd like to also think that when you would look by dropping down, and I don't know the all, all the rationale, but the Carver County project that's above it is above it by just one point. So it's very close. And if you look at the historical funding based on population and jobs, Carver County historically has done or overperformed on those measures. And if you look at where they are in this particular round, they're way over. And to have two projects in that category with all the local match that would come with it, I don't know if they have that or not, but I'm wondering um, if there's a way that we, I know that skipping is like breaking a rule or whatever, but it's one point. And to take that 10 or 7 million under either scenario A or B and, uh, you know, put it in the other areas. Dakota County has, doesn't do great under any scenario and to reappropriate that 10 million would give an opportunity for the projects that are in order. It would lift Hennepin and Dakota a little bit in the overall historical funding um, and also in the current distribution. So. I stand up for Scott County and that they should get something, but Carver is really way overperforming and for one point difference, I, I think there's an opportunity. I mean, no offense to Carver County. Um, I think there's an opportunity to skip that project, take those dollars and redistribute them in some of the other categories to provide more balance to Dakota and Hennepin. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think that potentially, at least my interpretation of it would be that that would violate the very first rule the technical committee has propounded, and that is don't skip over higher scoring projects. That threatens to undermine the entire scoring system. It's so one I, point, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Well, it, it, <laughs> Super Bowls are one on one point. Um, I think you have one more. Super Bowls yeah. are, uh, you either score or you don't. They're not as subjective as scoring pro yeah. uh, processes for uh, 
projects. I withdraw my comments. I, was <laughs> I, I don't give up a fight easy. <laughs> So, uh, Member Dugan, do you want to comment now that the commissioner has commented? Yes, I, I, I appreciate you know everyone's comments. They're all so, you know, so darn good. As I keep saying, this is the smartest group I've ever been on. Uh, or I think it was President Kennedy who said, except when uh, Thomas Jefferson dined alone in the White House. Uh, in, I support one B, uh, prim primarily. Uh, well, I thank Commissioner O'Rourke for, uh, you know, putting out there that he can, you know, that Scott County can do with the $7 million and they'll go from from there. But I'm coming from a touchy-feely situation. The comedy of this group, which impresses me so much about how we pull for each other and pull for the region, I think would be spoiled if each county didn't get a project. Thank you. All right, uh, now back to Commissioner Malushnik, and then uh, let's see, we had uh, uh, Mayor Winshuttle wanted to comment too. So, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make the motion that we adopt the 1B option at this time, if you feel it's appropriate. Mr. Chair, I'll second it. Heyman Rowland. All right, we've got a motion and second with respect to 1B. Now we'll go to. Um, uh, discussion on 1B and Mayor Winchettle. You're on mute, Mayor. I I don't know if this makes a difference now that a motion's been made, but I I was going to support 1A. If you look at if you look at Scott County's project and the amount of money that they have to bring forward to that project, um, we talk about congestion. I mean, that's the last traffic light from Mankato or from St. Peter all the way to downtown Minneapolis. I mean that really opens that up and makes that uh, a good roadway uh, for for commuting. And I, I just felt if you know, 1B still still covers it, but I'm just thinking the one, if you do the 1A, that covers um, that project and helps them a little better. When you, when you look at what they've, if you look at the intersection at 41 and 169, how that's changed that, this intersection is a very, very congested intersection and it's gonna change that traffic flow. Uh, pretty su substantially, but like I say, there's a motion made now. It's it's kind of a yeah. Well, it's, well, it's still. I what I what we what we hear you say is that you support one A. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, motion was made by Elaine. Is asking who made the motion? Member uh, Commissioner Malushnik made the motion. Commissioner Elect Eamon Rowland made the second. And uh, Nick Thompson has some uh, wisdom to impart to us here. Um, I just want to add that um, we had hoped that we'd get down to one that we could carry through the technical committee. And I just want you to clarify if we would still come back in December for the final approval. Is that correct? So I just want to clarify the motion for people. Um, That's Mr. correct. Okay. And I would also add this. A whole lot of good projects here as usual, and I recognize it's a tough decision for everybody. Uh, others, if you would just speak up, if you wanted to do a comment, that would be helpful. Some some things I'm missing here, so I apologize. Somebody has yes. their. Mr. Yes, Chair Geisler. Yes, Member Geisler. Uh, just to just for folks edification under one B over programming Carver gets eight million Ramsey gets four million Washington gets just shy of a million Dakota gets two hundred fifty thousand Scott gets seven million that's what that over programming breakdown comes out to for folks um, you know in in my professional life uh, if it doesn't feel good but it's still getting you closer to the goal that's probably the right choice um, so. Uh, you know, as, as I said before, I'll, I, I think we can live with 1B. I'm glad that we're spending over programming across the board instead of in just two counties. So I'm I'm, I'm glad we're we're looking at it this way. Other comments, Mr. Chair. Mr. Yes, Mayor. Or who was it, Sue Sanger? Yeah, Mayor Sanger. I'm not Mayor. Um, uh, first of all, yes, I'm okay with 1B. But I wanted to just um, underscore what the um, TAC recommendation was that we should not skip over 
any um, projects. The scoring, though, I think we have to respect the scoring. And I also think that we need to not spread the money over too many small projects. And the reason for that is, is twofold. One is smaller projects, the localities may have, it may be easier for them to fund smaller projects by other funds rather than depend having to depend on TAB. And the other reason is because there was a comment made in our materials that I thought was worth um, underscoring about if you have a lot of small projects, there is more greater money spent on overhead and administration of all of those projects. And by having the money go to a smaller number of projects, uh, we're getting more bang for our buck, so to speak. All right, thank you. And I think there was somebody else that wanted to speak. A quick, quick question, uh, Member Schember. No, oh, thank you. Member Schember, go ahead. Maybe someone from TAC could just comment on whether um, in, their, in their recommendation to not skip, whether there was discussion about scoring projects within a range or a margin of error, or, or is this an absolute, uh, um, what was the discussion in TAC? Can someone comment on that? Thanks. Uh, Lisa, do you want to take that, uh, Chair Freeze, or do you want to Sure, to I'll try and comment. I think that, that the TAC members felt that uh, all the applications went through a scoring process, but I think, um, and that, that they felt that the scores um, stood out and, and that, that they, as a technical committee, couldn't bring forward to you a recommendation to, to go away from the technical process of scoring them, that, that the scores are what they are. Um, I do think that um, there is some scores that there's very little uh, differentiation. I don't think one point really um, means that one project's better than another project in, in the whole scheme of things. Um, so you have to look at the detail of the scoring, I think, also in making some of your judgment about what areas scored higher on certain projects and lower on other projects because uh, the composite score hides some of that information. Hey, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Member Schember. Um, other questions or comments, uh, Mayor Stephenson? Yeah, you... I was just, was going to say uh, similar thoughts to Mayor Winchell. I, I think that uh, <laughs> One A manuscripts has a better option with some of the projects, especially as a tech mind being a poor country. I understand that to me, but I think that that's a potentially better option. Okay. All right. No further comments. Uh, I think we should uh, call the roll and somebody's got some feedback there. Um, so we should call the roll on uh, on the motion, which is to um, uh, make a recommendation uh, that we adopt uh, option 1B. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Boyles. Boyles. He had to leave, but he, he left a, te a text that said, um, what his preference was. I, I, I don't know. I can't see it now, but he had to leave. Okay. Crimmins. Crimmins. Degan. Aye. Foster. Aye. Martinson. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Giuliani Stevens. Aye. Gattel? Aye. Hammond Rowan? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holberg? Nay. Hollinshead? Aye. Karlowski? Aye. Lindeke? Aye. Look? Aye. Look, was that aye or nay? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mulichnik? Aye. Ewan? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Nalyanen? 
Narayanan? Aye. Thank you. Petrick? Reich? Aye. Sanger? Aye. Schember? Aye. Stephenson? Aye. Swanson? Tolbert? Chris? Chris Tolbert? Ulrich? Aye. Wind shuttle? Nay. Washi. I think he's I think he had to leave. Okay. All right. The motion carries. Um, we'll move forward with scenario one option one B. Thanks everybody for that great input. Um Quite a journey here. Every regional solicitation, as we continue to improve them, uh, uh, their objectivity, uh, their transparency, as they say these days, um, everything about it—the the equity portion of it, the balance part of it—really uh, well done by everyone. It just keeps getting better and better. The process. So, thank you for all of that, and we'll take up this uh, funding scenario then uh, for decision making. Um, we're going to advance the funding scenario to the to the um, technical people for um, further input, and then it will come back to us for a final decision on whether to uh, make a recommendation on one B to the council uh, once we've narrowed it down to this uh, to this uh, particular option for discussion purposes. So, does anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yes, happy holidays. Be safe. Happy Thanksgiving. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thank holidays. You, Thank yeah, you, everyone. Good Thank work. Thank you, staff. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. yeah, great work by staff. Thanks. Good observation. Thank you. See you all. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Happy holidays. Be safe.